And our second talent, we have Nick Bishop. You guys don't mind sharing a microphone, do you? I'm not going to say anything. He's going to talk, so I'll just sit here. It was all a dream. <laughs> so, you're an actor and a producer on this film as well. How did this project come about for you? Were you involved from the get-go? I was involved from the early stages of the film. Um, the writer, Gregory Jordan, and one of the other producers, Rick Mon Montgomery, he did a film... Um, an Oscar award winning film, um, Green Book. And a um, good friend of mine, he had cast me in something, and he said, Eamon, this film needs some of your sensibilities. Um, come on and tool the script, you know, develop it with us, and be a producer on the film. So I initially didn't think that I'd be acting in the film. <laughs> I don't share the likeness, you know, exactly of Willie Mays Aikens. So I really thought that I was there to. Uh, to just help with the development process. What drew you to that? I mean, you could have said, no, I'm too busy, I didn't want to. Well, the story resonated with me. I, you know, this is a story, this is a real story of second chance redemption. I think that we always need to ingrain that into our culture, into society, that you can make a mistake, but you can come back from it. You can always choose the next moment to make life better for yourself and the people around you. At what point did you realize this was a role that you either wanted to play or you were asked to play? I think they were. I think they were baiting me. You know, I think they were baiting me. <laughs> we were we were going through the casting process and we would be bringing up names and like I'd be like, yeah, this dude is good. I think he's in my Rolodex actually. I can. And they're like, yeah, but and they kept yeah button until. It was like, you know, Eamon, and I think there was a there was a point in time where we were doing a lot of dialogue um, work with the with the uh, script and we'd be late we'd be up late at night, the producing team, and we would be going over dialogue and and now I'm really, you know, I'm inhabiting the character a bit. And I think it was I think that kind of sealed the deal. Now the two of you worked together on Snowfall. Did you bring Nick into the project? Nick how did did I DM you? Did I, I think I snuck in Nick's DMs. I might have snuck in your DM. Strange sentence, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think I might have. I might have. I might have. I knew that Nick bared some resemblance to. I hate to say that because I hate when people do it to me, but I felt like Nick looked a lot like George Brett. Yeah, yeah. And there's a gravitas, you know what I mean? Yeah. Look at this smooth guy over here. So, the, you know, there's a confidence that George Brett has. He's one of the, you know, the biggest personalities in the sport, baseball, Hall of Famer, you know, declarated and, and really a charming guy. And so we needed someone that had, you know, that, that would bring it. And I knew Nick Bishop, I don't get to work, you know, um, Snowfall is such yeah, an we ensemble, oh, we okay. never get to work together, but we would always, you know, just respect each other's work on the show, and I've seen other stuff that Nick has done, so, was that it, am I making yeah, it up? Yeah, that's right. That's okay, right. so I did sneak in his DMs. <laughs> <laughs> so I came in to meet with, uh, I came in to meet with you and um, Rick, and clearly my voice sounds slightly different than the character, so I think that they really, for the because the director had to see, Marcel had to sort of make sure that I could pull that off, you know, um, and uh, I think we were okay, but Rick and the, the producers and the director wanted to see that it was going to be a good, a good fit, and then here we are. Now, Snowfall tackles similar issues, same but different, you know, a uh, uh, the crack epidemic um, were was that project something that initially maybe sparked the both of you towards this one because of some of the similar things? Not really. I, I feel like Snowfall deals with if we're talking about crack cocaine and if we're talking about prison reform um, in a different way than than this. I will say that. <laughs> It did help that I'd done a lot of research for the 80s, and I was um, a part of a show that's in the 80s, and that's when 
Willie went through his ordeal so I could understand trying to play someone that was at the height of their career in the 80s and just all the things around that time period and how we looked at drugs, you know, just say no pro campaigns and like some of the draconian laws um, that law, law enforcement and the government put in place. Um, so that, that's the only thing that, that yeah. seemed like a compar comparable. Yeah, so. so talk about the immense responsibility of playing two very legendary figures and, and they're also alive so they can actually critique you guys well, if they that, wanted to. Um, my response has been a couple of times when these guys have been on the road promoting the movie and, and the, uh, the writer Gregory Jordan called me one day and said we're here in, I think they're in Kansas. And they said, George Brett's here, we want to FaceTime you. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I was like, that's not going to happen. Uh, apparently, he approves of what, I, what I'm doing, and uh, he likes the movie, so that's kind of all I need to know. Hopefully, I'll meet him for a beer one day, but I, I think that's just a little bit too daunting because, you know, people say, what's your projects you've got happening? And I say, well, there's this movie coming out. Who do you play? I play George Brett, and the whole room goes silent. And I'm like, and I'm Australian, so to me, uh, it, you know, um, you didn't even want to talk to him as you were preparing for the role? No, because I think that... Um, <laughs> it was a wrong choice, but I, I, think, uh, I, think, I think the relationship between these two... I mean, I did my research. I, you know, I read up about him, obviously, and got a sense of who he was, and there's tons of great video footage of his personality and him throwing bats around and things like that. But um, I think this relationship on the page was very clear. And what the what the function of this character in his world needed to be was very clear to me. So that was kind of enough. And I knew that we would um, that we'd be able to kind of you know deal with all the stuff in the scenes pretty well together. So. And did you talk to Willie at all, or did you pull the same thing and said no, not at all, <laughs> no, thank you? Well, the thing is, when you don't bear a likeness to the character as far as physically, how some people would, you know, say, oh, well, you're a dead ringer for Willie Mays Aiken, it, it's kind of what, what Nick is saying, that you look to tell the story. And Willie knew my work before um, we embarked on this project, so it helped that he kind of was a fan of me, but not thinking that I was going to play him, you know? So so when... Because you dealt with the family or him as a producer when you guys yeah, were developing the project, yeah, right? Yeah, So okay. when I came in, he was like, oh, yeah, I know this actor. And, and of course, he liked some of the sensibility and what we want, how we wanted to treat his story. That was the main thing, is that I wanted to make sure that this was... He has a testimony. He has a story. He's not just a baseball player that made a mistake and has, you know, the record... Uh, mandatory minimum drug sentences. That's not what his life was about. That's not what his second chance was all about. He realized that he needed to have a life that was, um, you know, that through God, through his faith, that he was dedicating his life to service, that he needed to be in service of other people, that he needed to kill his ego. And that's the minutia of the world that I wanted to live in, uh, to be able to tell that story as impactful as we as we could. So how do you how do you do that then? I mean, how much talking to him? We just do did it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh no, no. I'm <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, are you, where where do you go for that research? I mean, I mean you're not going to watch YouTube videos of him hitting uh, his home runs because that's not what the story was about. But is, is it about having some type of um, mannerisms or not even that? There were certain things like the limp. There were certain things. There's little. There, there are little idiosyncrasy. You know, I, but I don't think that's what the move, the, the the role was really about. It was really about looking at his humanity, looking at the vulnerability that he has to be able to tell your story after you've been a pariah to a city, to an organization. You've been estranged from your family, um, and you still have the the hubris, the, the ego of being a, a big time major league player. I mean, I know there's a lot of, of my, my active friends here and we know how it is to go, how the career ebbs and flows and you can walk in one in one setting and everyone knows you. You walk into another setting and it's like, 
Oh, have you done anything? Have you? Oh, you're an actor. Have I seen you in anything? In another room, you can walk in and everyone knows your name. And as a baseball player, but this pariah to the city, he wanted to re he wanted to ingratiate himself back into his community and and change his legacy. And, and that's what he's living now. So as long as I got that right, that's that's human. That's something that I think we all can relate to especially now when we're living in this cancel culture like take away you know the 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 drugs and the bus that he was involved in it's just the cancel culture and how long do you have to wait till you are welcomed back or how much do you repent or what do you do to repent and um and willie was very stubborn i mean he did have the opportunity to talk at uh in congress a lot sooner than he than he he resisted that um, and what was what was behind his resistance? If if that seemed like a clear path to everyone else, that that's what he needed to do. Yet he somehow he, he didn't want to. I think when he came back home, he was really trying to focus on his family, and he was dealing with the shame. There's, a, there's so much shame. Um, he had a strained relationship not only with his with his family, the the. the you know, the nuclear family, but also with his mom, mm -hmm. also with his sister. He had let a lot of people down in life. And, you, you know, this is 90 minutes of his life, but this he, there's a book called Safe at Home that the writer Gregory Jordan, um, that this film is based off of, biography. And when you really look at Willie's, you know, Willie grew up in, in, a, in a shack in, in, in South Carolina. He was... He was. He came up really poor. He didn't have a roof over his head. Literally, um, he dealt with abuse. He, you know, he, he just he's lived he's lived quite a life. And um, and what was important for us in telling this story is that we didn't portray him as a victim. That there is an accountability when you ask. You know, what are the steps toward? You know, when we look at cancel culture and things of that nature, uh, we wanted to make a film that the protagonist, that the lead character, accepted responsibility and accountability. And yes, you see him going back and forth and has a little bit of victim blaming, but at the end of the day, he was accountable and we wanted to show what that journey looks like when you say, yes, I have made a mistake and you're willing to get it right in front of people. But that takes a lot of courage to get in front of Congress. Um, another thing about Willie Mays Aikens is that he grew up a stutterer. Um, so there was also the, he wasn't the, I didn't want to overly portray that in the film because he's over that, but that was something that happened to him in, pri in prison. So when he came out of prison and they asked him to speak in front of other people, he had that fear of public speaking. So there's all of these things that he had to overcome really to step into being of service. Um, and, and that's what we wanted to show, that, that accountability. What was the most important aspect for you when making this movie? You know, you've got Marvel movies. They, their job is to, you know, entertain and, and portray the superheroes. You've got movies that are, have a strong sense of social justice and want to bring certain social issues to light. In this particular case, there's a lot of different themes going on. It's part biopic. It, it is part social justice with the, the draconian laws that he was a, a victim of. It is about redemption. Was there something that you always had to say, like this, you know, eye on the prize is, is this thing right here? Yeah, for me, eye on the prize was always winning his daughter back. Um, that's the real legacy. Baseball, um, speaking at Congress, even, that's, he stepped out of his daughter's life when she was about six and didn't show back up. So 14 years later, on our press run, I was able to meet um, his actual daughter, and there's still something there. She wouldn't come see the film. She would. She came to a dinner that we um, that we held for it in Washington D.C., um, and she came and supported her her dad, but she wouldn't come to see the film. There's still he's still working that relationship. So I, that, that's what the film is about. The film is about that if we're estranged from anyone in our in our lives, you don't have to be in jail. There's family members, there there are people in our friendships, 
uh, for the people that you love, we can always make the, the choice in this moment. We can go outside today and, and pick up the phone and try to reconnect with people, um, whether they've wronged us or whether we've wronged them. And it's those type of um, values, those core values um, that hopefully we impart in this film. Beautiful. I wanted to just throw out to the audience if anyone has any specific questions for either Nick or Eamon about anything. Yes, great, Miss Gentleman with the Hat. Okay. Um, I, I really had a question before, but you really answered it. I just want to say, Brother Eamon, uh, that scene with you talking to the kids, I really felt that part about you saying that speaking in public, I got that, and I just, man, I just really felt that. I was going to ask you if he had that. But you actually just um, said that, so man. Um, that was a good day in the office. I was saying, that was a beautiful scene right there, my brother. Thank you. That's a, good one. That's a great scene. There was another hand right here. Yes, sir. What actor most influenced you, Nathan? What actor or most. What actor? Or actors. Most or actors. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick, okay. Nick is Russell Crowe. I say my uh, one of my acting teachers, uh, Henrietta Edmonds at Howard University. I would say uh, Tasha Smith. On the big screen, I would say um, I really love Jeffrey Wright. I really love the work of um, Angela Lewis. Where is she in this? She's somewhere. Angela Lewis. I love the work of Angela Lewis. Um, there's so many actors. I steal from everybody. I love it. I love this crap. Sean Riggs over there. There's so many actors in, this, in the building kingdom. But I've had the pleasure of working with so many of you guys that's here to support me. I really appreciate y'all guys coming out. And, and to work with, to work across from an actor and look in their eyes and see that they give you something, those little moments, those little, you know, I'm always stealing. But well, wait, <laughs> I'm always sit, being in tell, you guys had a lot of little moments when you're sitting across that table at the restaurant and you, you've avoided going to him for help. You finally cave in, you do it and you're, you're pleading. And I, I know there's a lot of pride. Don't want to sound too desperate. And your hands are tied kind of sort of because, you know, optics, right? So tell me about filming that scene because there were a lot of moments that you guys probably had to give and take to one another. That's why we that's why we brought the boss in. That's why we brought the big guns in. <laughs> Nick Bishop, I knew that, you know, with the with that role, there was a shame on Willie. The entire film and the pride of, of you know, whoo, the pride is something, you know. Even in my own life, I recognize the places where I, where my pride or my ego can just can cloud things and make things way more difficult than they need to be. Than if you reached out and you and you ask for help, and it's really hard to ask people for help, especially the people closest to you, for some reason. We make that obstacles in life. So that's what that, uh, a lot of the film was, I mean, a lot of that scene um, for my POV was charged with the shame of seeing, it's okay to be mano a mano, we're both home run hitters, you bat third, I bat cleanup. But it's different to walk into a place and say you need something, a handout that you need someone to believe in you to go and speak on your behalf because you messed it up, you know? Um, so, yeah, and then to have someone across, an actor that understands that and to be able to play with Nick and, you know, for him to suss out those vulnerabilities. From the jump, you know, I came in with a, with a sort of, uh, I don't know, a humility. And from the jump, you know, first take, Oh, cut that out, man. You know, like how your people would be if you're coming in like, hey, man, what's that energy? Come on. What's up? You know, but at the same time, you saw when he was when I was, he thought it was about money. He had a perfect excuse for me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, Jake, I'd love to hear your take. Well, I mean, very much the same thing. You know, I think that it, it, it's, it was a, a really nicely written scene, you know, in the sense that you've got this guy who is still um, loved by the Royals uh, post-playing and is, you know, one of the greats of baseball. And so his life is very, well, seems to be very much in control and he's got fortune and wealth and he's got um, confidence and you know his family is all good and all of that and he's very highly regarded um, and I think for someone that he came up with and that was like a brother to him playing to, to come and sit opposite him and, and ask I think there was a great deal of respect of that and that's certainly what I was trying to bring across was that it takes a lot of balls to do that you know um, it takes a hell of a lot of balls to do that from that position, and I think that you just got to kind of, as Eamon was saying before, about being an actor and working with each other, you just got to allow yourself to be available to what he brings in the room, and the rest of it, the camera just captures it. I didn't have to do that much. Yeah. There was a question right here, yes. This really touched me. I'm so happy to see this come to fruition. But your time with Mr. Aiken, how much time did you spend talking to him to bring all that humanity to the surface like that? Um, to really get to the core of who he was, to be able to portray that? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I ever accomplished that. Um, but to, because if you hear Willie speak, I mean, this is a dynamic guy. He is such a charming um <laughs> Yeah, he would like. I wish. I wish that we could have had him here. He just lights a room up. It's big energy. The the energy he's gonna. He's infectious with his story. He lives this testimony. He is big. It's <clears throat> let's fix. You know, my I trash my life. Let me tell you how not to go down this road. There's a reason why George Brett. I mean, these are guys that represent huge corporations. MLB isn't playing that game. You know, the Kansas City Royals um, organization isn't playing a game of bringing someone in that uh, that casts such a, a nasty shadow on their organization. He is that dynamic. He's a one of one. Um, they've talked about taking Willie around to all of the farm, um, all of the development um, farm leads to, to be able to talk to all of the players because as we know now we're dealing with fentanyl we're dealing with different types of drugs but the same type of stories you know um so i just wanted i was able to talk to him before shooting he was on the set while we filmed um none of that felt um overwhelming it was just new information so much more information that i could soak up and hopefully i got just a slice of it you know, hopefully there's just some of it that that was able that we were able to stick to the uh, to the screen. He did that. Question right here in the front. Uh, this is for Eamon. Uh, congratulations on a beautiful film. Now the um the physicality that you brought to the role, just how you moved when picking up the thing, just everything from swinging the bat. Um, can you speak about your preparation for that? Mm. Truth. <laughs> give you the secrets here. <laughs> so I was able to get to um, I was able to get to Augusta much earlier than usual as an actor because I was producing right so the way that I um, one day I knew Willie has this hip thing, right? And I knew I needed to get it, but also the age, you know, because I wanted to age up a bit for the for this role. So what I did is I walked more than I've ever walked. I walked all of Augusta. I would just walk, and I would walk really late at night and until my back got tired. And then... Since I, I'm dang near in every frame of the movie, I knew that that would fatigue me so that the shoulders would drop a little bit more, that there would be a, a physicality, you know, that there would be a hip 
that hip would work in. And then this is the bad part. I probably drank myself stupid one night. <laughs> I drank myself stupid. One of those on the on the on the on the floor of the bathroom. Accidentally or on purpose? Both. <laughs> and then I got to the place where I said, oh, you, you know when you're on the floor and you're like, oh, God, I'll never do this again. <laughs> and I said, that's the guy. Yeah. That's the guy. Yeah. That's the dude. Yeah. But there was Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else have any questions? Right here, sir. Whoops. Amen, Joseph. How was it playing an imperfect father to win back his little girl? Mm -hmm. That was the most fun. That was the most fun is, is winning over. Dynamic actress, uh, young Olivia. Olivia. She, she was amazing. And, um, and what's also fun about producing is that I was able to pick her. I saw her and I was like, it's her. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of young actresses that had um, a lot more credits and bared more uh, similarity likeness, but she was so dynamic. Um, but it felt really good to play an imperfect father, to fight for a relationship with father and daughter. Um, you know, I know like someone mentioned Marvel and all that, like, yeah, please sign me up to the Marvel film. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where story really lies. We want to, you know, we want to see great father and daughter relationships, father son relationship. We would like to see a family get back together after being estranged for so long and it work out. You know, he went through a lot of different things with lupus with his uh, that's another thing about Willie his 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 wife is still wheelchair bound. Mm -hmm. He so so he he takes care of his wife. The baby Sarita, she is now about nine so he takes care of his wife that is wheelchair bound and his daughter that's his life and trying to restore the relationships with with his other children that's that's his life you know so it really felt good and that's what i think is the lasting impression for him as well what do you want people to get out of this film when they walk out of here today? Yeah, like I think we've, we've covered it. Like, it's family is everything. Family is everything. Um, take accountability and, and, and go after your second chance. Any other questions before we wrap this up? Yes. Well, I know that you're a father. So I wanted to know, through, you know, playing this role and seeing the challenges that he faced with his daughter, how has that influenced you as a father? Um, like, what deliberate or intentional things do you do to connect with your daughter and to make sure that you have a meaningful relationship with her? Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't. It's it's hard, but you don't want to make. I mean, we're fortunate enough to use other people's lessons. So that we don't have to make the same mistakes, right? right. And um, and I think you know part of being a good husband and father, part of being a good uh, father, part of being a good. I guess what I'm trying to say is that to be in your children's lives, you have to be in their mother's lives. Mm -hmm. So it's about making sure that you take care. of all the relationships that revolve around you, no matter what, you know, that you, you know, and because there is the example. And I think, um, I think Willie would attest to that. You know, we talk a lot about, about fatherhood and, um, and he's a better father now because he's a better husband as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out here. Thank you guys so much. Congratulations.